As rocket designers in Germany, we have a little bit of a problem. We're not allowed to use black powder explosives in our recovery systems. Of course, the standard solution is just to put some explosives into the nose cone so that when you reach the target altitude, you just send a signal and then boom, it'll push out your nose cone really easy. So what do we do when that option is not available? At Astra, we've come up with a complete in-house design where we're gonna use springs and servos in order to generate this push that's gonna get our nose cone away from our body. And we've also come up with a pretty clever way to test that, almost simulating the zero-g environment of space. Why is that important, you might ask? Well, the destination of this rocket, which the nose cone is being built for, turns out to be space. This is all part of Project Carmen, which is Astra's flagship program to build a rocket which will go to space. Astra's main target with the separation system for transcendence is to have an activation at apogee, which means that the activation should occur when we reach 100 kilometers, which is essentially space. And we want this activation to push that nose cone away from the body of the vehicle so that we'll be able to use the parachutes when it comes back down. If the nose cone is still connected to the body, unfortunately, those parachutes won't be able to deploy and, well, we're not going to get that rocket back. So the first target is to make sure that we push that nose cone away from the vehicle fast enough so that we're pretty sure that the main body of the vehicle won't interfere with the parachutes anymore. In this case, we decided to have the requirement being that the nose cone should be pushed away at one meter per second or more. But it takes quite a bit of force in order to achieve that. So how are we going to do that without using some sort of explosive? We have the technology. Well, it turns out that springs are pretty good at storing mechanical energy. So we decided, why not try those? We decided to go with a rotationally latched and unlatched system, where basically we rotate a ring, and that's what allows for the activation of the springs or not. Here you see four servo motors, which are attached to gears, which are able to rotate the main ring. This ring has eight specific grooves in which these screws are able to go through, and they have a thin slot and then a thick part of the slot at the very end. So basically while it's in that thin slot, the ring remains latched. But as soon as the screws move through the grooves to the open hole at the very end, the ring becomes unlatched, and then the springs are able to push that ring away. For the main aluminum housing of the structure, we were able to get some help from a company called Aljo, who has some access to some CNC mills, which were able to mill this shape for us. For the manufacturing of the rings, we were able to also get some help from another company called Evite, where they were able to have another CNC mill, which could basically create all of these fancy shapes that the rings are composed of. Finally, for the servo motor housing, which sits inside of that aluminum housing, we were basically able to just 3D print that on our own 3D printers. All in all, it wasn't super complicated to make, so we're probably fulfilling that simplicity requirement at least for the time being. But how do we properly replicate the conditions in which we're actually going to be flying transcendence? I mean, we're going to be at like 100 kilometers high, there's going to be no air, and we're going to be essentially weightless. So the nose cone and the body of the vehicle will just kind of be floating up there. But we live on the Earth, and things don't just float around on Earth. so. How are we going to test this thing so it simulates that environment? Of course, one way to do this would be just to have the whole thing underwater. But unfortunately, water and electronics and servos don't really mix very well. So fortunately, that would not be a very good idea in this case. But there's another way that we can use a pre-existing test stand to actually achieve our ambitions. If you remember back to the guillotine testing, where we basically have this giant frame which can test some of the shock deployment forces of our parachutes, we can actually use this frame to maybe simulate a zero-g environment. If we run a line through the top of the stand and put a counterweight on one end and have the actual weight that we want to push off of the separation ring on the other, we can essentially have those two balance each other out so that when that ring activates and pushes the mass off, it will basically float upwards as if it were in space. This is essentially how an elevator works in order to conserve power, where basically you have a counterweight to allow you to conserve momentum as you're going up or down. Essentially, all you need is that initial acceleration to get yourself moving, and then you should stay moving, provided there isn't too much friction in the system. In order to have proper fidelity with the Transcendence rocket, we have to have a five kilogram dummy mass placed on top of that separation ring. That's essentially gonna be the mass of the avionics system and the parachute recovery system, along with the nose cone. And of course, we had to put a five kilogram counterweight onto our special stand in order to have that all balanced out. And our way of doing this was just to basically fill up a bottle with water. 
This actually works really well because you can kind of vary how much weight you put into that. You have to kind of add a little bit extra water to counteract the friction that's in the system. So this gives you a little bit of flexibility. Two, one. Nothing's happening. Okay. They turn very slowly, but there's a spike and then there's nothing. Yeah. Three, two, one. Nothing's moving. Nothing happens. But we have a current spike. Let's go. Ready? Three, two, one. Nice. Well, it did come off. Unfortunately, through this next round of testing, we didn't really have much success. We weren't actually able to get the separation ring to actually separate from the system. So, <laughs> not a very successful test, I would say. But why was this happening? After all, it did work before when the ring was just all by itself. In the previous test, we only used two springs in order to create the force to push the ring off. Whereas here, we're now using eight springs because we're using the full weight of the system. But it turns out that those springs actually create a lot of friction on the ring itself. We weren't really using any lubricant, and it was clear that that was kind of causing the whole ring to stick. We actually had one other problem, which is that the wooden pillars that we used to mount the counterweights were actually in the way of the gears themselves when they were rotating. So actually sometimes those gears would actually get caught on that wood and essentially not work anymore. Finally, to add insult to injury, we actually put a little bit more weight than we were supposed to on that uh, dummy weight. We actually need five kilograms, but we were actually at somewhere near seven or eight kilograms. So maybe we got a little too carried away with the weight we were putting on it. So next time we're definitely only gonna put five. A couple weeks later, we came back to the lab to once again, try to make the separation system work. Except this time we're armed with a couple of changes to make sure that this would work this time. First off, we decided to bring some lubricant in order to grease the ring so that it slides better on the springs and in the grooves for the screws. Secondly, we designed some inserts which we could put over top of the springs in order to reduce the friction that they had on the metal rings themselves. The springs kind of end in a very sharp point at the tip of them, which can actually cause them to kind of dig into the ring as it gets rotating, and that can create a lot of friction. So with a bit of a head on top of that that's a bit smoother, we're actually able to achieve a little bit of a smoother rotation of that ring. Finally, as mentioned before, we had too much weight on the actual test piece itself, so we decided to reduce it to the actual weight, which is five kilograms. So finally, we're ready for the third round of testing, the true test of the system. Is it gonna be able to deploy our nose cone in the depths of space at 100 kilometers altitude? Three, two, one. Boom. Awesome. And just like that, we have a successful test. But we decided to test this a couple more times just to make sure that these results are repeatable and that we can be more confident in the results that we're getting. We also attach the servos to the actual battery pack that we're going to be using on the flight just to verify that there's no differences in the power and the current and the voltage that are being supplied by that battery. So we're happy to report that Mark 1 of our separation system, which is going to push our nose cone away from the main body of the vehicle way up in space, is fully functional and ready to go. We have a couple more design upgrades to do just to make it a little bit more reliable and we're also of course going to make it a little bit more functional so that it can be placed inside of the rocket body itself. But the main functionality of the system is complete and we're quite happy with the results. If you have any questions about how we built the separation system and how we tested it, be sure to leave them in the comments below. And remember to expand your horizons.